Hey, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of uh, The Say Report. And uh, I'm going to warn you now, things are probably going to get a little harsh because I got some juice to throw. I want you to know <laughs> what we are doing today. We are watching the one, the only Encino man, California man for you, Will. Um, but uh, <laughs> we're going to check out uh, the... Uh, the 1992 classic Encino Man, but more importantly, we are going to be looking at the. Oh, is it 1993, Dev? The year 1994. It is 1996. 96. That's even worse. The four years later sequel, uh, <laughs> Encino Woman, the made-for-TV uh, follow-up to the Polly Shore classic. Uh, oh man, hi oh, God. So. I want to just remind everybody what we're doing. It's uh, Brandon Fraser History Month, and uh, we have for years talked about going back to, I mean, the beginning, really, of everything, right? Encino, man. Um, and we realized that in this retrospective year that it was probably a good idea for us to not only go back to that, but to maybe, as we did last year, do the uh, the Not Without My Fraser sequels. Um <laughs> In which, uh, in which we see the the follow up films to Brendan Fraser that he has had on numerous occasions. Uh, I think we've figured out last year, besides like the Mummy, right? Like it's the it's the only real one that uh, he ever came back for. There's always a follow up, and he's never involved. Yeah. Um, and that was definitely the case here. It is All right, so we're going to explore these things. What it means to be someone who celebrates Brendan Fraser History Month is going to be a big like thesis topic of next week's episode of the Say Report as we celebrate five years of celebrating Brendan Fraser History Month. It's right. gonna be wacky and wild. But today when I was telling people that I, I, I'm watching Encino Woman to celebrate Brendan Fraser History Month, and then had to explain that he has done so many films that have sequels that don't feature him. I got quizzed as to, oh yeah, and what are those? And I just rattled off six films. Yeah. And it was one of those situations where like, I, I shouldn't have asked you. This was a <laughs> dumb thing I did. <laughs> What have I done? Yeah, uh, yeah, man. So let's uh, let's do it, man. Let's check out these fresh nugs. These fresh nugs, uh, or, or in one case, kind of a crusty. <laughs> oh fuck, man! So I can't believe it took us this long to get to this, but I'm so happy that this is the way that we chose to go about this because I don't know if Encino Woman would have ever truly registered for me. If it was not for the fact that we were doing it as the Fraserless sequel to Encino Man, like we would have probably, if we'd done Encino Man five years ago, right? But like brought up the fact that there was a made for TV sequel, and that would have been like my fun trivia at the end. And then we would have probably said something that in retrospect, five years later, we hate ourselves for and then moved on, right? Um, but uh, oh man, we got to talk about Encino Woman, Dev. <laughs> yeah, we kind of do need to talk about Encino Woman. Um, beforehand, I just kind of want to like brief overview in Sino Man and just where I was at the end of it and that okay. was I was not prepared for a die staff sequel to Encino Man at the end of Encino Man that movie yeah. is rough yeah Encino Man itself yes yeah I'm focusing on the 1992 movie Encino Man rough doesn't even begin to describe it um, it, it felt like watching a, not John Hurt, uh, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> uh, John Hurt, right? Um, but it felt like watching a Brad Pack film with just Sean Astin. And like, so like none of the true Brad, Brad Pack, right? Oh, oh don't forget um, that Ki Kwe Kwan was in oh, that that's film. that's true. He it's does the show only yeah, yeah. Goonies sequel reunion moment to have ever happened in television. In, I mean, in uh, movie history. Yeah, I forgot that uh, that we did get to see our, our, our boys show up. Um, no toys this time, though, which was uh, sorely disappointing. He is kind um, of the president of the computer club, which seems like <laughs> what Data would do in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> also, I'm so, I did not write down Ki Hui Kwan's name. And I'm like, I can say it, though. I could, I could do it. I'll commit. Yeah. <laughs> Whew, oh, man. But... So, yeah, so... um. There, it's more okay. Here's the thing that kills me. So, Encino Man, quick rundown of the plot. Um, we see in the past so many distant 
de- decades upon centuries about millennia ago we see a um a young caveman and his partner uh trying to light a fire earthquake comes they get buried cut to the future in which we see sean astin digging a hole and he discovers said caveman all right and so he digs up this frozen man in the ice him and his friend stony uh decide to put the put put the man uh, in front do they purposely try and melt him out i couldn't i couldn't quite remember like forgive my ignorance in, in like trying to re- like rewatch this movie like half paying attention because it's fucking Encino man. But they were they purposely trying to melt him out or was it a, a lucky coincidence that there were heaters on that? On, you in that do crotch? not put together eight space heaters without mm-hmm. intentionally trying to melt the man out of okay, the ice. Okay, so they're they're trying to melt him out of the ice. It's not an accident. Here's the thing. I thought it was on purpose, but then everything I read acted as if it was like, and I mean this down to like the Wikipedia page, the IMDb synopsis, everything talks about it being an accident that he gets melted out because of some space leaders left on in the in the garage is, is like the wording in all of them. Um, and so, like, I, I started to kind of question myself as to which I, I had missed it, right? So, I don't love to, I haven't, I didn't see any of these. I don't really like to Monday morning quarterback the way that I'm about to, the things that you've read. It's accidental that he's alive. They fully intend to melt that ice and then present the preserved cave body that they found in order to become rich and famous as archaeologists. Okay, all right, I so, can see where you're going. Yeah, yeah, they so, think they're going to just end up with a zombo and then just like... <laughs> no, right. they think they're going to find a corpse. A corpse, they're like, even worse. Nobody's going to yeah. freaking care about this guy who's who's in, entombed in lifting a phrase from Encino Woman, a glacial coffin. <laughs> they're going to want to see the body. Yeah. So, so we got to uh, so melt, melt this the, ice. Right? Yeah. And so then also... And then also there's the fact that Sean Astin believes when they come home to the ice melted that the body melted with the ice. (laughs) Despite there being no viscera at all at the scene. Just water, which was your goal. I feel like in terms of the stupidity of men and the sexism on display of like teen comedies, right? You can look at something like, uh, like The Breakfast Club and it's there, but like it's dramatic and it's well played, and like there's a there's a reason to go back to that film and really kind of study and explore how people really were at that time. And then you have something like Weird Science, where you're like, all right, this is entertaining, but this is starting to get gross, guys. And then there's Encino Man, where every dude's an idiot and a sexist pig. And I don't mean that in terms of like shame on them for displaying men that way. It's like, lo and behold, this is what we became in the early '90s, guys. Like, like I don't doubt for a second that this is exactly the way that people were. <laughs> Were acting in certain circles in the 90s. <laughs> Whoa. I am not an idiot and a sexist pig. I'm a unique weasel. <laughs> oh, I can't man. do the noise. I, ah! I've been trying to do the noise. I cannot do that freaking noise, noise that Polly Shore can do. Um, but uh, yeah, so so they so they accidentally on purpose let out this caveman. Um, but lo and behold, he's a pretty rad dude. <laughs> <laughs> and he hangs out with them, uh, uh, gets moved into Sean Astin's house. He, he moves in with Dave and his family under the pretense that he is an Estonian uh, exchange, um, student. exchange student, right? Yeah. Um, he hangs out and plays with a dog, and that's pretty cute because Brendan Fraser is just being Brendan Fraser, really, in the background. That's really, like, the, the bit of this movie is, like, this movie happens, and Brendan Fraser just gets to play around on set without paying attention to anything. He, he reacts to a couple of things that happen, but otherwise he's kind of doing his own thing for every scene that he's in. And then towards the end of the film... Uh, it's revealed that he's a caveman, but everybody thinks it's cool that he's a caveman, so it's not really that big of a deal. Uh, end of movie. No joke, that's the plot. I will say, there is one important, little, tiny, significant detail, just because we're going to talk about Encino Woman. I mentioned early on that there was a partner that he got buried with, and we are then introduced in the last final moments of Encino Man to a woman that did uh, unfreeze, somehow figure all of her own shit out, thank God for that, and then end up in a bathtub and we get, like, uh, uh, Link gets his prize, played by Brendan Fraser as the as the caveman, named, now named Link, uh, gets his, he finds Encino Woman in the bathtub, jumps in with her, right? Devin, <laughs> why doesn't Encino Woman just you use that as its jumping off point that's a they really... introduce yet another 
Encino person <laughs> to the mix. What they introduced, and, you know, and then reference, and then reference Link and his girlfriend in Encino Woman. This isn't like that man from two years ago or whatever the fucking nonsense is. Jeff, Jeffrey Ross, who is in this movie, says, <laughs> "No, no, 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 no. It's not Jeffrey Ross who says that." Or is Jeffrey Ross doing a double role as the nerd who works at the preschool and oh, the INS no, you're agent? Right. You're right. No, 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 no. He's the INS agent. It is the it is the science teacher at the school who is, by all accounts, the only scientific reasoning in this entire film. <laughs> and his scientific reasoning is, this would be impossible. Mm -hmm. And then David's sister, big air quotes, because I did not know her relationship to David. Until the line, you, I, you've been, I've been honest with you ever since we made out, and you told me I was a bad kisser. That's okay. The movie forgot to straight up introduce her. She just shows up at some point in his house, and you're, and they're talking as if you've met this woman before. And you're 57 just fifty-seven like, minutes in, they give her a name. Fifty-seven <laughs> minutes before we learn her name is Chris. Lucy. And then ten minutes after that, and then ten minutes after that, I'm pretty sure there's a moment where this movie suddenly becomes a lesbian love story between her <laughs> and, and Lucy. And the Cino woman. Yeah. All right, so, I mean, that's the real... Oh, there's so many crimes. Okay, so that was Encino Man, and no. we are introduced to an Encino woman, and then we find out that's not the Encino woman. We then have Encino Woman, and guess what Encino Woman is, everybody? Everything I just said to you, just, you know, with a female lead instead. All right, so I need to I need to address some things in Encino Man before we move on to the fraser -less sequel. Like, because it, it needs to be addressed. <laughs> Everything that was written for that movie is god-awful. Because the only two semi-redeeming qualities of mm -hmm. Encino Man are Pauly Shore and Brendan Fraser. And as you've already said, Brendan Fraser pretty much doing whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah, Brendan what... Fraser's not in the movie. Brendan Fraser just was around while they were filming. Yeah, and they're like, and you're a caveman. Go. And so he does that. And Pauly Shore whose character was not in the original script, but they liked Polly Shore's audition so much, they wrote him in. And by wrote him in, they're like, you just, you just talk. You just say whatever you want. We're not going to give you anything important to, like... So the, the same direction they give Brandon Fraser. They yeah. just tell Brandon Fraser, do what you want. You just don't speak English. And then they look at Polly Shore and they're like, just do what you want. You don't speak English. Okay. <laughs> yep. And those become... The two shining moments of Encino Man. The most important thing to know is that Sean Astin's David Morgan character is a piece of shit at the beginning of the film, has no character growth, and is still a piece of shit at the end of the film, but he is rewarded with his longtime crush as his girlfriend. I honestly, if you like, like, and this is no slight on Sean Astin. Or Anthony Michael Hall when I say this next sentence. I think they are both phenomenal actors and have proven in other work that they are definitely worth a damn. But at the time, like, I swear to God, I remember this movie of Anthony Michael Hall in the lead. And I know it's because of just, like, weird science. Like, like it's it's that it's that whole, it's the same attitude that he has in, um, uh, is it 16 Candles? Where he plays the dude that's, like, convinced he should get the girl the whole time. The and, like, geek? <laughs> He's a character yeah. who doesn't have a name, just the geek. And then yeah. at the end of it... He's given Jake Austin's or Jake Paul is is a is Jake something. Yeah. He's just given her drunk girlfriend as a prize. Yeah, it, it's, it, Anthony it's, Michael Hall found himself constantly playing this character in in these movies of like the the guy that at the time everybody was like, oh, he's just the guy that's down on his luck. Let's give him a prize too. And then in retrospect, we're like, oh, you were the nice guy. He played the nice guy. And then that gets blown up in the, like, Revenge of the Nerds series in which the nice guys are all the main characters. But that is exactly who Anthony Michael Hall always played. So in this movie, Sean Astin playing the nice guy role is, it, it, like, I in my head just replaced every scene of this movie with Anthony Michael Hall. Dude, he's not, he's not, oh, he's so creepy, too. When he brings the picture of them in the bathtub to the to Blades, which is the yes. coolest place in town at Ice Rink. Yeah, Which, yeah, yeah. I mean, is it the coolest place or town or the coolest place in town? I messed up the inflection there, but I think the joke still it's not a joke. <laughs> it's 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 yeah. the it's the joke, it's a bad joke. that it's is a on poor, the level of Encino in yeah. Man is working on yes. the whole movie. The other thing that Encino Man brings us, and then 
I am ready to kick it into high gear and talk about Encino Woman, the mm-hmm. fever dream that America collectively experienced in 1996. Um, Rose Everybody McGowan. Dinosaur? Oh. Rose oh, McGowan's oh. <laughs> first film. <laughs> nice. Is, yes. is Encino yeah. Man as his younger sister, Nora. Oh, my God. And the really upsetting, <sighs> like relationship between her and Shore in the whole movie. Like I like Polly Shore's entire like flirting with this like 13-year-old girl in front of her parents and and like you can argue that it's only in those moments just to fuck around with her parents, but that doesn't make it okay. In fact, in a lot of ways that makes it worse. Like there's oh my god, the, Dude, the whole movie just is just upsetting from tip to toe. Double in fact, that that bit right there has to have informed son-in-law mm. when he says when he says to mr morgan someday i could be your son-in-law after marrying your beautiful baby girl and you're just like oh that's weird and then a year later son-in-law comes out and it's basically the exact same story like Polly shore pitched a movie in his improv in that moment and it's really <laughs> sick because it's also this moment that is like beautiful and honest where he yeah. admits that the only reason I'm munching on you, I'm wheezing on your juice is because I don't have the whole Brady Bunch thing going on at my home. Yeah. Like, yeah, no, I mean like he's playing the, he's playing the down on his luck best friend that the, that the well-to-do family has allowed in and in any other story, in other, any other Disney story, that's the other thing we didn't mention. Oh, yeah. This is a Disney branded film. And in any other Disney movie, he they'd go full Sean Hunter with him. You you would love this dude by the end of this movie, and you just can't because of who the character is and who the and what the movie is. And I will say that like like before we get too far away from Encino Man, because we can't do it without like giving Pauly Shore his due. Like there is something about to, to be said about Pauly Shore's career in which that dude kind of discovers like the shitheadedness within himself, and in later Pauly Shore films, like leans into that, and like so the highlight of that is Biodome. Right, in which him and, and Stephen Baldwin, the worst of the Baldwins, play the worst people. Like the movie acknowledges that they're terrible. Whereas in this, you're supposed to be rooting for him. By the end of Biodome, there's very much this feeling of like, yeah, this dude needs to grow the fuck up, right? And like, so like you see his career kind of evolve into that, but it's not enough to to justify the actions of this movie. Um, but yeah, so that's so that is Encino Man, right? Right in a fucking nutshell. That is that is it in 1992. We all walk away, learning to do the caveman dance, and then quickly forgetting that Feeding there's a the music monkey. video. <laughs> there's a music video for a band that nobody cares about at the end of this movie, and it's amazing. Um, but yeah, so the movie is. The movie is just on the edge of forgettable, right? Like, it's this thing that, like, in, let, like, let me put myself into the 90s. I was aware Encino Man existed, and even I, who would watch the worst shit in the world, like, I was just, I would sit at the table of Pauly Shore and say, feed me Biodome, feed me Son-in-Law, feed me in the army now. I never quite ever went back to Encino Man as much as I do to those. It was on a lot. Again, being a Disney-branded movie, it was all over the place. Like, in, in terms of, like, being on on the free weekends or, like, being on on HBO or older cousins, like, watching it and stuff like that. But I... I was never quite drawn to it. And now I'm starting to realize why. It's because I never really kind of clicked with some of this weird stuff. And this is from a guy that loves Bill and Ted. Like, we've talked about our love of Bill and Ted. And fuck me if this movie is not informed by Bill and Ted and Wayne's World in some way, right? Yeah, it is. It's so strange. It is the product of trying to be like what came before and just completely misunderstanding why what came before worked. So let's add to that formula for a shit sandwich a little bit of that made-for-TV mustard, my friend. <laughs> because that's when you get Encino Woman. Encino Woman is the product of both being a sequel of this film and that wonderful special bakery that is the Saturday-Sunday night Disney made-for-TV movie. Disney Family Presents or whatever Disney fucking nonsense. Disney Films Presents. Oh my god. Michael Eisner walking into his office, sitting on his desk and just looking at you like Daddy Stark being like, so, you want to watch a family film? (laughs) Like, (laughs) Alright, so, just Uh... full disclosure, Encino Woman, by all accounts, has been completely stricken from the record. 
yeah the, of life of, of the universe like, not that, just not, not not just anybody's career like literally as a as a collective people we have decided just, that it just didn't happen what we're doing now might be a crime against the history of humanity no Devin. do you know what's a true crime forgetting this film i think and i am gonna say this now at this point how long have we been recording give me a minute 20 time. minutes <laughs> In, 20 minutes Sejin says this, Encino Woman is a better and more important film than Encino Man. I said that. I finished Encino Woman. I went upstairs to get some sun. And I said, I can't believe it's better than Encino Man. <laughs> and everybody in the house was like, you fucking lying. And I'm like, I really wish I was. Now, I'm going to put a huge caveat on this. It is still a steaming pile of poop. It's like Mickey Mouse walked into Michael Eisner's office and was just like, ha, ha, <laughs> like, like that. Like, it is definitely that. I am not in any way saying this is a movie that anybody should go out of their way to find. I don't know what you did, Devin, in order to get us a copy of this film. I pray to God it doesn't send you to hell for too, too long. But whatever you did might not have been worth it. But it is still better than it's seen on man. Yeah, it is. It's, it's. It's so crazy that they basically follow beat for beat in Sino Man, and they are able to make a better film on made for TV budget. There's two restraints. things that they do, but there's two things for Sejin that they, they do to make it better. First and foremost, female focused. There is there is this weird level of like a feminist story in this and now informed from like the mid 90s. So I'm not saying it's good. Again, I need that to be clear every time. But there is this weird level of like a like a, a feminist beat to this film that I think already makes it a step above the just atrocious sexism of the first one. And then on top of that, they don't they're not in high school. They're, they they age everybody up to be adults. It's just we, we are just bluntly just talking about 20 to 30 year old people in this film with those two moves. They make a much more interesting, like, product that, like, uh, you know, like, as an after-school special might have been, like, worth watching at some point in the 90s. Yeah. The fact that they're older, there's there's this moment in the first Encino Man where they give Link a bath. And they basically empty all the chemicals out from under the sink. The ones that later in the 90s we would be warned not to touch. And they give him this bath. And... I was a little bit uncomfortable watching these two high school students wash a Bait man. man. <laughs> like, a man, yeah. And also, um, I, like, he's not a high school student. He has to be a bit older than them based upon just everything. Like, oh, he doesn't Bible look does like he's a high school student. years old, so of course he's much older than them. No, I yeah, of course, right? Like <laughs> When he went into the ice, I think he was in his yeah. 20s. Is, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, but I will say this, I, um, uh, I was concerned because realizing that Encino Woman was going to be beat for beat, also like what we were seeing happening in the movie, otherwise, I, I, you, you know that moment's coming, right? He's going to have to quote unquote clean her up. I don't know of any like polite way to say that, right? Like there's, but he's going to have to go through that exact same scene in Encino Woman and my butt was clenched. I didn't know what they were going to do, and I was a little worried. I mean, on the one hand, I was watching a made-for-TV Disney movie, so it couldn't be that bad. But on the other hand, this man was going to bathe this this woman that, like, for all intents and purposes, was, was like, in a very uncomfortably powerless position for him, right? And their decision in Encino Woman to turn it into a no-joke, black-and-white slapstick bit a la, like, Abbott and Costello completely divorced from the rest of the film might be the only way they could have done it <laughs> like like they pull a they pull a move out of their ass that is just so far removed from the rest of the movie that it takes what what is an uncomfortable scene and it is still uncomfortable but at least couches it in this idea of something so utterly fucking ridiculous that like you kind of forget just long enough how upsetting the concept really is <laughs> So for me, I was clenched knowing that, like, the cleanup scene was going to come. But then they introduced David's sister. And I'm going to start calling her Chris now. But I really felt that he lived with, like, his sister. And I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. So then the getting Does clean. Does he not? No, he doesn't. Okay. 
okay, 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 wait a minute. No, no, no. She lives in that house. She does not no, live so, in that house. First of all, I thought a stranger walked out of a room somewhere and he was just okay with it. They, now you're telling me, actually, that's what happened. <laughs> that is actually what happened. Because, first of all, what you need to understand, for, first, we're talking beat for beat. His name is David as well. They named the main character David. And I, I can't believe that they did that. At least his last name is not Morgan, but David is still our main character. At least they didn't name her Linkle. Oh my god. <laughs> Don't mess with Linkle. She the best thing that's come out of the Legend of Zelda franchise in the last five years. I will fight you to the death. No, I'm with you on that one, my bud. Um, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, buddy. so... Buddy. Um, yeah, so you get... So, his name is David, and David... By all accounts, it looks like he lives in a house. But he lives in an apartment. He calls it his apartment. And there are shots right near the end of the film where you can see that it's sort of a duplex style situation. Yeah, I was thinking kind of like uh, Mitch and Cam's place in Modern Family where, you know, they live in the downstairs. There's an apartment upstairs and in that they own it, but I could see him renting it. Yeah, I, I Cal California uh, real estate is not what caught me up, my friend. <laughs> right. But so that woman who I thought was his sister because, yeah. oh, they clearly live together. There are the tiniest clues that they're not related. A la, we made out that one time and you told me I was a terrible kisser. And he's like, "What? why didn't you just walk in? Like, you're always doing that. And she's like, yeah, but I've changed. I, I realized that I want to be a better person. And that made me realize that she's his next door neighbor. And the fact that she's just in his apartment is because they're friends who live next door to each other. She's essentially Kramer. I mean, I was thinking more like a Mr. Roper. Like, I thought she was kind of, like, in charge of his apartment, which is why she, like, had a key and all that. Um, no, but, like, I was only kind of half-joking when I said, like, like an hour into this movie, they introduce this character, and then not ten minutes later, they introduce the idea that there might also be, like, a lesbian subtext to this with the neighbor and uh, the missing link in the second one. What is her name? Lucy? Lucy. After, yeah, yeah. after Lucy. Like, it's the this movie is so clever. The mm. references that are on display in this movie, like, these are people who are pleased with themselves. Like, naming her Lucy after the, the or, or did we name that, name that cave woman that we found in Africa, Lucy, after this movie? I can't believe that's the case. I can't, I don't want to believe that's the case. I'm not even going to do the research, because if we find out it's true, I'm going to be sad. So we're just going to assume it's not. <laughs> yeah, but like, her name Lucy, there is that, that first... Like, like, Michael Eisner talks... Oh, my God. Michael Eisner talks about Otzi, who was found in the Alps right okay. around the time that Encino Man comes out. No, 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 no. We're talking... I'm down... Devin I, I, I just I just need to put a time up for one second just to, just to describe the ways you and I watch this movie and how I cannot watch it any other way. So we mentioned that this was a made-for-TV Disney film, right? Like, this, is, this was part of that 90s era where, like, everybody would get around and watch, which were sometimes, one out of ten times, classic Disney films that were premiering on Sunday nights on ABC, right? So with that, we watched a version of this film with those inserts. The commercial would, would, would come, and it would cut to those moments with Michael Eisner in his office. I wasn't joking. Where, like, this thing is, like, this thing is couched in the idea that, like, hey, every ten minutes, we're also going to just cut away from the action of the film to just some Disney, like, introductory shit. And, and it's, like, it, it was weird because I never really thought about the idea that we've kind of lost that, but we really have, right? Like, like we've lost the, the Disney spearheaded, like, I'm the guy that runs Disney talking to you, my audience, right? Walt used to do it all the fucking time. There's so much great footage of Walt Disney where he was doing, like, the 20 to 40 minute long videos about, like, hey, here's what we're up to at Disney World right now. Or here's how I do animation. Or here's what we're doing next. Like, Walt Disney knew the, knew the, um value in in doing those like talking to the audience around the like the around the fire t talks that uh fucking wh who eisenhower used to do right like that kind of shit the right five side and, chats yeah, yeah yeah like like he but 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 disney knew the value in doing that while maintaining the image of being a family company are you 
whether or not they are that I like that's beside the point that's the way that they put themselves out in the world right and Eisner really kind of this is his chance to do the Disney thing otherwise he is not Walt Disney right but these moments where he gets to do the I'm talking to the audience every Sunday night I am piped into their home on these commercial breaks for this movie right and I I didn't realize how much I miss that like <laughs> like we just don't get that anymore and and having those interstitials while watching this insane batshit movie was a whole other level of bizarre that i don't think i can experience and see a woman ever without those interstitials and like the moment when he sits down on a couch with a guy in a caveman suit i laughed harder than anything else in the movie <laughs> yeah i gotta i have to admit if I I have a lot on my plate as as doing what I do, like trying to put together this airport, the next mission I kind of want to embark upon after our experience with to Riverdale and back again, and now with Encino Woman, is like tracking down copies of all of these made for TV movies that have been lost to time. Yeah. All right. Now time back in, Michael Eisner and one of these interstitials talks about Atsi, the Iceman that we found in the Alps, right? Mm -hmm. That happened the same year that Encino Man came out. 1992 is when they found Atsi, and there's a big belief in Hollywood that it's one of the reasons why Encino Man was successful. Because at the time, everyone was caught up in Iceman fever. I don't mean Val Kilmer. I mean... <laughs> I can't, I can't necessarily argue against that, though, right? Because even people who worked on the movie will credit anything but the quality of the movie for the reason people watched it. The director of the movie is this dude of of, of Encino Man, is this dude... Um, Les uh, Mayfield. Yes, Les Mayfield. Um, I was thinking George Zaloom, but he's just a writer and producer on it. And yeah. uh, you ever want to look into an interesting career? Zaloom is one of those dudes that you probably have seen on a bunch of Disney shit, and you just didn't re register his name, but he was there the whole time. Um, but uh, but on this, he's an actual writer. But yes, Les Mayfield, who also did a bunch of Disney stuff, but was known more for behind the scenes stuff on documentaries. Like this is his chance to direct a, a live action Disney movie, and uh, and even he will credit like Wayne's World. <laughs> and like Bill and Ted and stuff and he'll be like yeah if it wasn't for the success of those films before us like like Wayne's World came out 92 as well not like four months I think before Encino Man and he's just like everybody really liked Wayne's World and then that fever started to kind of go stale so then they came to Encino Man and it's just like why can't you for two seconds be like maybe I made a decent film because Encino Man did really well it's part of the reason that Pauly Shore and um, Brendan Fraser's careers take off is like Encino Man just despite the criticism, does financially well. And then, like, Fraser benefits from then also having uh, school ties the same year. So then, like, people are like, oh, he can draw in a crowd with the moneymaker like Encino Man, but then he can also put the work in like he did with school ties. That makes him a quality actor. Pauly Shore doesn't have that benefit. All he's got is Encino Man, and you see what happened to his career, right? <laughs> well, but you totally see, since it is Brendan Fraser History Month, how School Ties and Encino Man is the reason he played George of the Jungle. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt in my mind that yep. George of the Jungle is a fusion dance between David of School Ties and Link of Encino Man. For sure. Yeah, I like he he is definitely like I said, he proves himself being able to do the physical shtick with the comedy of, in Encino Man. And so that's where you get to see all of his great comedic stuff going forward. I mean, I'll even cite some of his lesser successful stuff. But, like, like um, I'm thinking of uh, of Monkey Bone and Bedazzled, right? Like, like, and you see Fraser's career that way. And then you see the, the well-acted stuff. Like, I mean, you see School Ties, but then you also see Gods and Monsters. You see Crash. You see, like, these other ones that he does, right? He... He, yeah, it's it's a great year. It's a great year to be Fraser. It's a great, <laughs> but like, yeah, does, it, it doesn't happen with a Cena woman though. Ain't nobody breaking out of that shit. Well, God. Jeffrey Ross, Jeffrey but Ross, and also Joel Murray. Like I want to give credit to the 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 <laughs> the poor man's Rick Dukeman. Um, it, oh my God, this it's insane. But Seijin, I have to. Lucy, the first cave woman, is named after Encino woman. 
It has to be true because Michael Eisner talks about Atsi being found in the Alps and then says, we haven't found any prehistoric women yet, which means that when they first found one and named it Lucy, it was a reference to Encino Woman. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to have to Broken say, to say those words in that order <laughs> together. But it has yeah. to be the truth. Yeah. So Encino Woman is like this really weird film that I'm moving past this. Look Smart. how fast I'm That's moving fine. past this. That's fine. Go. Fly. Yeah, but, it, but Encino Woman is, as a whole, right? Like, as we said, the structure is pretty much the same. Like, this 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 woman is buried in ice. Um, they make a fucking joke out of, like, people dying in tragic deaths back in the prehistoric age in the first, like, two seconds of this film. Like, earthquake insurance. Bummer. It's like, oh, God. Ouch. <laughs> With the slide transitions? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. I did not and, and realize terrible. how made for tv this movie was some terrible song that probably played at the peach pit at some point or like the fucking bronze on buffy i was like what is this nonsense like like it's not atlantis <laughs> more set but it's like if somebody hit atlantis more set with a brick this is the song that would come out like <laughs> i don't know what that opening song is for the for the credit roll of your made for tv movie but it sure wasn't fun in any way <laughs> I tell you what it was. It was a distinctly different version of a popular song. Because that happens with a weird version of Relax by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And a mm. weird version of Smells Like Teen Spirit near the end of the film. Oh my god. Like it's, this movie is so crazy. Yeah, but yeah. so it starts with that. But the cra the wildest thing is that there is, like there's no... Encino Man does not build enough science for me to talk about, like, the sound science of Encino Man, right? Like, like we can talk about that with sci-fi movies all the way back to things like Alien and The Thing and stuff like that. We can talk about the sound science of science fiction and how good science fiction always has science that is well-grounded within its own world. But, but outside of the movie, obviously, you can pull it apart. Blah, blah, blah. Encino Man doesn't bother with that because it doesn't have to. Encino Woman... Not only does it not bother with that, it chooses to remove it completely. There's no... The, 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 the scene that we spent a lot of time talking about at the beginning of this episode, in which they find a frozen man and then put him in front of, like, like heaters and boom, like, that's it. There's just, there was an earthquake, we are now in the future, there is now a cave woman running around L.A., at some point she's in front of the Hollywood sign screaming at the sun. That's, that is the, that is it. And so she's just running around L.A. and she just happens upon this one guy whose first reaction to her is, maybe I should ask her on a date. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it is the immediate, it is the meet cute between the two of them. And she jumps on his hood, screams at him in a nonsense language, shakes what looks like just a fucking like wooden dowel at him, but I, I assume was supposed to be a weapon of some kind. And then runs away. It has a spearhead. It's not looking good. But it's supposed to be a spear. And his immediate reaction is just, I should ask her on a date. Wow. He is, Dave, In if I thought Dave in Encino Man was terrible, David in Encino Woman is utter fucking trash. Ah, <laughs> uh, preach, brother. It is awful. And then they're able to introduce Jay Thomas as his boss, Marv Beckler. And Jay Thomas is not acting in this movie. I am convinced because I've heard the reasons why he was fired from Cheers, which were <laughs> he was mean to Rhea Perlman. Like in the press, he would like denounce the fact that he played a character who had to be married to a character played by Rhea Perlman. He's the asshole in, in Cheers, though, right? Like, like just just to, to ground this, he is the the ex-husband that's, a, like, a total shitbag no, in the show, right? No, the ex-husband who's a total shitbag in the show is not Chaz Palminteri, Cher's dad from Clueless. I can't think of his name. Oh, I know exactly who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, like Palantonio yeah, yeah. or something like that. It's he's, he's great. He plays Nick Tortelli as mm -hmm. Carla's ex. Jay Thomas is introduced around season six as the goalie for the Boston Bruins. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I remember him. Fuck me. I, and, I would not have if not for this, like, in-depth conversation, though. Fuck that dude. Yeah, fuck that dude. And then 
he was mean to her, so they wrote him off the show to be traveling with the ice capades. And then he was mean more, and they just killed his character off. So it's just like, Jay Thomas, first of all, imagine getting on Cheers at all as a recurring character. I mean, never mind three years in when it was like starting to fucking go gangbusters. Yeah. Six yeah, years yeah. in where Diane is out and everybody is excited about Kirstie Alley mm. because the show is more fun without Diane. Like, it, it's it's insane. And you get a part on that, right? Like, you could be a part of television history forever. And honestly, the only reason that anybody knows Jay Thomas is because, oh yeah, he got run over by a Zamboni in Cheers. <laughs> they certainly don't remember him for his role as Jay Thomas in Encino yeah. Woman. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he shows up and just, just, again, doesn't act. I think this whole movie is just full of people that they didn't even bother asking to act. They were just like, just show up on set. Make sure you hit this point. Go. <laughs> Jesus. But yeah. So, I mean, the, the important thing is that David works at a marketing firm. And... They're trying. And he works with Budget Carrot Top. We can't we can't forget Budget Carrot Top. I thought top. it was Matt Stone for a real long time. I thought it was Matt Stone. <laughs> um, Roger, the character who like is this this universe is Stony, and I yeah. was way off. Well, so you kind of think it might be at first, but then he's a real tool, like a real tool. <laughs> yeah, he's a real tool. And it turns out, I mean, we're not there yet. Let, let's let's get there naturally as we talk through this movie. Uh, but currently, uh, Becklin and Cashew, or I don't, Becklin and Cash, it's just Becklin and Cash, are working with Jean-Michel, who's just a famous crazy person, it seems like. He's sort of like a Dior, I guess would be the closest analog. Maybe. Okay, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Because I, I, he's not just perfume he's also clothes there was this yeah. real big thing in the 90s if you listen you probably lived through the 90s but if the 90s are a foreign concept to you there was this thing in the 90s where we sort of became obsessed with fashion and it and it came from nowhere and then it receded just as quickly just to, to speak to our audience, imagine if Will Ferrell's character in Zoolander wasn't being played as as big of a joke as Will Ferrell plays him in Zoolander. That's a pretty solid. Thank you, Seijin. Like, like that's the that is the idea, right? Is he's this huh. he's this conglomerate of just it, everything that's in this guy's involved in, like that he is it, and on top of that, he's out of his fucking mind. But in this movie. While the joke is that he's, like, an oddball because he's rich and famous, there's never a moment where his rich and famousness is questioned. <laughs> it's just like, oh, yep, he's got money, so it makes him weird. <laughs> and it's just like, that, wait a minute. <laughs> and he is developing a new scent called Primal, and what he wants is a wild woman to be the face of Primal now Perfume. I, I, isn't it Primal 8? It, I don't know if it's an 8 because it's a snowman. It's Which two 8s on top of each other. So it might be Primal 88? I primal don't know. Primal 88. I, actually, Primal 88 is now suddenly a scent I would buy. <laughs> so we can't go that far. <laughs> okay, it's just Primal. Like the whole, it's because it, that's just but what the, the joke, bottle is shaped primal like. Primal 8, it's right there. Oh my god, this movie. <laughs> I know that Primal 8 is right there, Seijin. I understand that, but I actually think the design is meant to be like a DNA strand. Like it's oh, a double so helix nice. shape. Oh God. Oh my God. Like anyway. It's, yeah. She's so primal. It's in her DNA. Yeah. Oh God. Oh. I hate this. <laughs> I had the creeping so. horrors last night and they're coming back. <laughs> So yeah, so he's developing this scent. He has a he has a spokeswoman who we are led to believe is uh, completely out of line because of the way that she is being screamed at by the director. And then she says he keeps yelling at me, and I think we're supposed to think that she's being the one that's over the top, but I didn't. <laughs> And I was like, no, we watched that dude scream at her. That happened. Okay. We watched that dude scream at her, but apparently the shoot started two hours ago. And then she just cash walks in. 
not in out not in wardrobe or anything like mm. I'm the most important thing. I mean, she's also a monster. As much as Rick Overton's photographer character is, like, classic Rick Overton character in the 90s, uh, she is like, oh, I guess that's why they pay me $20,000 an hour. And I'm like, oh, so you're also an awful person. Yeah, they, but they they treat the fashion world as if it's filled with aliens, all right? Like, <sighs> like, like think of any movie that you can think of that showed you an Andy Warhol party and the crowd that would show up to those and like, oh, Yoko Ono's in the background. And like, and like, and and then you look at somebody like Lady Gaga a la like 2007, 2008, and you're like, she'd fit right in with that crowd. Like there's that, there's that weird concept of like people that don't understand what humans are. And that must be what everybody was like in, in, in this particular world, right? And so they, they play that super over the top for this so i think what it is for me is not so much that she is not also a pain in the ass it's that within that world she is just a woman working <laughs> like they present a world in which everybody is insufferable so like i kind of have to adjust my 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 take on who's a shithead and who isn't and i gotta say this woman that they introduce is not high on that scale <laughs> So it's in... compared to some of the other people in this in this world. I mean, if we're going to compare it to Encino Man, and it seems like the place to to do the thing to do, she's the Matt Wilson of Encino Woman. And when we first meet Matt, who is the girl that Dave um, Sean Astin is pining over in Encino Man, he doesn't seem like a total tool bag. He just kind of seems like the the popular dude who this girl is dating. And it's not until later that we see that, oh, no, this guy's a fucking asshole, too. Like, yeah. they just gave us that slow burn. In that first scene, they try to give you, like, that little hint that she might not be great either. Yeah. But you're not wrong. Based upon everything else we've seen up to that point, if this is the world she has to exist in, that would be her defense mechanism in order <laughs> to survive and keep her sanity. Yeah. And then when she is pushed out by Lucy, uh, because uh, these cave people, they love music. And yeah, I get. But again, not, not pushed out by Lucy. Lucy doesn't come in and gleefully take over her right. position. She is pushed out by all of the people around her <laughs> that then would rather play with Lucy. And it's a real weird thing that she focuses on this one person as opposed to, like, you know, the, the, the social circle she was in that treated her this way. <laughs> right. But that's the thing. So then you see this slow burn of her being, like, kind of worse and worse it's really yeah. interesting to compare her to the matt wilson character from the first film because yeah. that's sort of the only thing his biggest crime in that film is jealousy and that's exactly what ivana represents in encino woman is she's jealous of the hot new thing that challenges her place in society well and again in the real world in the first movie M matt's character matt wilson's character would be somewhat justified in the beginning of being like, that dude that's an asshole and was an asshole to you your whole life, that's the guy that, like, you really want to spend time with over, like, me, your, your boyfriend. boyfriend? And, yeah. I, and I'm not saying, like, like that, that he gets to lay claim just because of the title or anything like that, but, like, we are shown that Sean Astin, Dave's character in that movie, we are told how he tr mistreated Robin their whole lives and now she's in love with another guy and like he, that's now when he realizes he wants her like fuck you dude like dude. <laughs> like you don't get to do that now like i'm the one that's been kind enough to her that we have a relationship you don't get to just storm in here now and be like no me want instead and like fuck that <laughs> yeah Polly shore being like if you'd asked her out in middle school you'd have got her and then him being like, yeah, but she wasn't a babe yet in middle school. It's like, I can't like you, Dave. I can't like you, Dave Morgan. You're a shallow piece of shit. Go <laughs> dig a pool in your backyard. I Go hate dig you. A pool. Oh, shit. Yeah, so, but, so, so anyway, so different, uh, so that's where it, things get a little weird for me in this one is, like, there's, there's no moment of that. She is just immediately made this, like, this antagonistic figure to this other woman, and it is, it, it, it I just, it is 
classic trope <laughs> that like women have to fight each other for the same position. Like it's just it's a, it's an upsetting like common story that uh, that this movie uses. That's all. Yeah. No. No. It's. I don't love it. I don't love their interactions throughout where she like everybody is under the um, the idea that Lucy is from Hungary because the first word she learned is Hungary. Jesus, this movie. Um, yeah, so so that's the situation. So she's trying to take advantage of the fact that she thinks this woman is a foreigner by misrepresenting what it means to work in America while at the same time selling her out to INS, which is the weirdest connection to the first movie. Because there's that scene in the middle of Encino Man where Link steals the driver's ed car and they go to a Mexican bar in the middle of the day and it ends with an INS raid. But th that's what they think it is. Really, it's the police that they're to arrest the student who stole the car. But they're all like, policia, immigration, and everybody freaks out. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, so you guys saw that scene and you're like, oh, you know what? Immigration would probably be on the heels of a cave person because they don't got papers. Hey, well, you know, they didn't get out the phone for anything but tax evasion. I know. I saw the <laughs> Untouchables and we'll talk about that after Brendan Fraser History Month. Oh, man. Yeah, it's just, it's so weird. And I will give them some credit with Encino Woman. Giving Ivana INS as like backup or like supporting antagonists so it's mm -hmm. not just her who's like after the the cave person is smart because it makes well, her seem less petty or less like she's on a crazy downward spiral like well, matt right. wilson goes from bully to fucking criminal like in no time flat in the first well, movie and, and we and we see that the stakes are i mean literally the stakes are meaningless in encino man because the only antagonistic thing that matt can hold over anybody's head right well we should stop calling him that what is his name in that movie what what is matt wilson's name in that movie is it matt, matt? wilson matt wilson is no, no. the character wait who's he played by though it's i um, don't know who he's played by <laughs> Uh, wait a minute, I have I literally have the list in front That's of me. That's fine, Matt Wilson it's is... Michael, the... it's Michael DeLuise, all right. Yeah. Michael DeLuise, but, uh, yeah, but it's Matt Wilson but, is the uh, character. But, but the only reason that Matt Wilson is is uh, is able to hold anything over their heads is he's like, I'm going to reveal your secret that you're a caveman, which first of all is fucking insane. Like, why? How how easy would it be for them to just be like, you're you're the weird one. You think this man is a caveman that came out of the ice? Like, it'd be so easy for them to just fucking turn that on him. So like, he already doesn't really have much he can lord over them. And then he finds some photos again, meaningless, like meaningless photos. And then he presents them, and everybody believes him, and they don't care. <laughs> there is leg legitimately this moment where everybody's just like yeah that's actually cooler and he's just like no my plan has been foiled and it's like fuck you guys like fuck this movie there is no stakes throughout that entire film and so like it just pulls the rug out from any any top possible like rewatch enjoyment of that movie because you now know that like nothing matters right at least in Encino Woman, like, that shit matters. They are like, no, we're going to find out what the deal is. The government's involved at this point. They at least make the stakes higher. <laughs> I gotta, I have to say, when they were first introduced, and I'm like, oh, there's Joel Murray. I didn't even realize it was Jeff Ross yet. But there's Joel Murray, and I'm like, these guys are the X-Files, right? They're trying to fit in every pop culture thing that's hot right now into yeah. Encino Woman. So these guys are men in black government agents who have been sent to collect another cave person. And it made me sad for Link because everybody knows about that walking tribe of Africa that they found in Encino a few years back. So like, oh God, what happened to Link? Right. I mean, they even lay the fucking groundwork down for the idea that we know that cave people exist. So why did we need to do this whole thing about her being a ferner and it being INS? Why not just make it just, oh yeah, it's another cave person in Encino. We've already we've already admitted to that conceit in the first 20 minutes of this movie anyway. Dude, so it's like, not why even not in Encino. That? It's in Hollywood. <laughs> well, yeah, the fact that she comes out of the ground 
uh, up in the Hollywood Hills and then finds her way down to the Hollywood Boulevard in a matter of what I can only imagine is 40 minutes in her personal time. <laughs> like, <laughs> Dude, there's that beautiful moment where Chris is like, she walked in L.A.? <laughs> Like, yeah. yeah, that's crazy. You're right. There's a lot of holes in this movie. Please stop pointing them out. Only good character. Oh, man. Yeah. And they, yeah. Like to the fact that they also have the Encino protest later on in the movie. And I'm like, what? This movie is called Encino Woman because people don't understand that it was called Encino Man because he was found in Encino, California. What? Like, well, in considering C- that the rest of the world knows it only as California, California man. man. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. I mean, and the other thing is that they're Mustasterian because that's a word that is used in both of them. The Mustasterian bowl, which is the first thing that they find in the pool. And then they talk about a bunch of Mustasterian artifacts. And then also Jeopardy comes up in both movies. I, usually I would do this at the end. I'm in a fever dream right now. I like the weird little things to be like this exists in the same world don't yeah. think for a second this doesn't exist in the same world they reused the footage from the beginning of encino man siege yeah but it's not the same person <laughs> it's, i just can't believe that they go through all of that setup then they write the sequel and at some point, somebody made the conscious decision to be like, no, 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 not that Encino woman. <laughs> like, what are you doing? No, this is Hollywood woman, but we'll call uh... it Encino woman because we kind of set up for a sequel. The thing yeah. about finding out about Encino woman years later, and I mean like the very first Brendan Fraser history month that we celebrated on the Say Report, I found out about Encino Woman and made it my personal goal to find a copy of it. Because as a child, Encino Man was two things to me. It was a Pauly Shore movie and it ended on a cliffhanger where they found a cave lady. And I a wanted cliffhanger. To... I love it. I love. I love young Devin's version of a cliffhanger. But yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, well, what's going to happen with her? There's all sorts of different culture things for her. And like, I need to know. I need to know what happened. So then I find out that oh, they tried to answer those questions for you, Dev. I don't know what you were doing in 1996. Too busy to be watching Disney Film Presents on a Sunday night. Yeah. So let's let's pivot to the end of this film, because I think it's important to talk about the end of Encino Woman, specifically to talk about why I think it's a much, uh, at least more watchable film than Encino Man, with something, Encino Woman is at least a movie with something to say. Whether or not it says it well or says it correctly, I that that I don't I don't think it succeeds, and you know, maybe you do, Dev, but, but Encino Woman, separate from Encino Man, becomes a movie with something to say because you start to realize in the back half of this film and finally in like the final act of this film that this entire thing is just about the way that, not just the way that David, as a young upstart like man, talks about women throughout this whole movie, which is atrocious, but like the way that this entire world, men and women included, and 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 the and the fashion industry and and they introduce this this concept and this idea that there are people that are othered, right? And and that those people are not always treated well. And sometimes those people have to stick together. And in that in that, people like David, who are who are cis white males are not necessarily always welcome in those circles because of their their attitude and their and their privilege and their life like there suddenly becomes this like weird commentary that starts just kind of simmering under the surface and eventually boils over to become the end of this film in which like we learn that like you know these assholes are are just that like they're assholes they, they they shouldn't be in charge and they don't deserve to be in charge and the way that they treat people is horrible and horrendous and all of this and what they do and say leads to the ways in which other people treat and say each other the reason that we get to see like lucy get mistreated by other women in this movie is because of the way that those women are treated first by this other thing there's this whole weird like like social commentary on women in this particular industry, in this particular part of the world that is put on display in the final moments of this movie. Again, I'm not saying they do it right or well. I want to make that clear because I got some real issues with some of the stuff that is on display, specifically when like they go to like the, 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 uh, the party that is being hosted by, 
I don't think it's divine, but it looks like somebody trying to pretend to be divine, which is kind of upsetting. Maybe it was divine. No, not... so the reason why this film persists, right? The reason why people still know about Encino Woman and the way that I was able to track down the copy was because that sequence, that party that they mm-hmm. go to features so many, and I do not use this term as a derogative, weirdos from the 90s. Right. It People is, that self-identified. And, yeah. I mean, she, um, Brenda is the character, and and, and she calls out um, creepo, creepazoids, uh, oh, uh, freaks, cretins, uh, cretins. Yeah, wannabes, she uses so many... and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have it written somewhere. But yeah, it's like that whole moment, but it made me realize that there was this weird time in the 90s where being weird was an identity. Like, that's who you were. And we actually kind of see that with people who we've looked at at the show, like Jim Carrey and like Adam Sandler, who established their mark on the world by doing something weird and then being able to pivot. Yeah, this is a whole other podcast, but talking about specifically how successful white males like Adam Sandler and Jim Carrey were able to, in the 90s, kind of wrestle the idea of being the weird outsider away from people like Brenda, like Divine, like like I I, yeah. I only name dropped a Divine because like y- y- this is like a key example, right? Like John right. Waters and Divine and, and the films that they are making and in that <laughs> the, the weird like the weird worlds that they are creating for people to be comfortable and okay with themselves in are like are are at some point usurped by by white dudes that then get to say i'm gonna make six million dollars a movie being that and it's just like okay that wasn't what we wanted <laughs> like <laughs> yeah it it just because there are so many like every it's so crazy to me that Polly shore doesn't show up somewhere in this movie based mm-hmm. upon literally everybody else like, if you want to, the thing that you can find on YouTube right now, if us talking about Encina Woman has made you interesting, that party scene, and in pretty good quality, is available on YouTube to watch. And if you go to the the description of it, it talks about all the prominent people who are on display in that in that scene. Mm-hmm. And it's wonderful. It's this... It's this like absolutely wonderful thing and then it keeps happening like down to the fact that bobcat goathwaite kind of cameos in this film he does and you have to you have to believe that his fucking contract for this movie was i am in a fucking hotel room sitting in a hot tub if you care to come and film me for 20 minutes then fine i'll be in your damn movie (laughs) don't bring a (laughs) funny hat also bring me a lot of cocaine (laughs) (laughs) it's there's so much in oh there's so much in this film. Yeah. But I'm going to I'm going to write look at a quote that I said that kind of sums up exactly what you're talking about about this industry doesn't give a shit about these people that it is exploiting. Nobody likes you. You're here to sell clothing. That's it. End of novella. Yeah. Fuck that guy. My combs, my brushes and combs. Like it's it's upsetting. It's like really upsetting. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 there's there's some stuff that 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 like gets kind of thrown out there and put out in like you take a moment and you're just like, oh shit, like this could be real. Like this could be a real movie if somebody had just kind of like put their foot down at some point and said, no, we're going to do this instead. But nobody does that, right? And, and in a lot of ways, it's the same kind of slack that that Encino Man gets. A lot of people, um, I, as I was doing my research on this, really point to the fact that one of the biggest disappointments with Encino Man, and the reason why it's so hard to go back and watch, is there's actually these clear moments of, like, kind of genius moves in terms of comedy. And I, specifically, the, the, the moment that gets cited the most is um, going to the going to the museum. And Link seeing like these these caricatures of himself and possibly people that he even knew on display. Like 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 there's this weird idea that that he goes and he sees the ways in which he is presented in this world and, and it freaks him out, right? Um and that and that is a moment that is seen as like a possible death that then goes nowhere, 
right? Like it's never, it doesn't amount to much else in the rest of the movie. And the idea that it's not more addressed throughout the film, the idea that like, he's really freaked out. He just, he so quickly like falls in with these people here. Right. And, and, I love the idea that Polly Shore's character didn't exist initially because this is more to the point because I was going to say one of the best things about Encino Man is not just the two of them as these these characters, but their relationship and the ways in which Stoney, Polly Shore's character, it, the idea that he kind of becomes this, this evolution of what Link was, this idea that like – that we have not evolved as much as we thought we have. It kind of becomes like the joke of that movie, but that joke only works if Pauly Shore is there. If, if he is not there, if Stoney's not a character, that, that joke is not present, which is weird to me because to me, that's the entire movie is that idea of like, he fits in as quickly as he does because we haven't gotten as far past the bullshit as we thought we have is like the whole concept. <laughs> and so in Encino woman, that is elevated to the idea of like, like we have actually devolved. She is this strong, powerful character that comes out of the ice ready to stab a bitch to protect herself. And instead she is put in this really submissive role by all of these men around her, by this world around her. And it is only at the end of that movie when she is allowed to be strong and powerful again and David admits that he's a fucking asshole and doesn't deserve her, that is when everything kind of falls into place properly. And so like, it does better than Encino Man, and I guess the reason it does is because Encino Man never intended to have that message, whereas I feel like Encino Woman, they at least went in wanting to tell that story. Yeah, watching Encino Man, I my notes speak of all these moments of nuance, these moments of, like, quiet beauty that I, I don't know where they came from. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I didn't highlight them more is because then, as I researched the film and found out that, like, Brendan Fraser was pretty much just there and told to do whatever. And Polly Shore didn't exist and was also given that same note. That, oh, sure, like, might still not exist. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Polly Shore is dead. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's one of those situations where all of those moments that shined for me, that like really meant something to me, are, are not there in the film without those two actors. Right. And it's so rare in a film, especially something like Encino Man, where there is this this quiet heartbreak to that scene in the museum. Like, you, you feel for the guy because he hasn't really had to think about the fact that everything is gone, that right. he is alone in the world. Well, and it's literally only been days for him at that point, right? Like, like this is not a movie that takes place over a year, right? Uh, it's probably been about a month. Okay. If I if I had to give it a timeline, I don't know. You're right. The time is doesn't make a lot of sense, but whatever. I mean, they they they're at the prom at the end of the movie, but we don't know when it started. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's um, just because comedy always has to end at a party, man. Yeah, exactly. I thought that party sequence was so much longer than it actually is. <laughs> it's one minute. I thought it yeah. was like the third act of the film. Uh, but it's just one of those situations where if all that nuance came from these actors, then I understand why I celebrate Brendan Fraser. And I also understand why in the 90s, Polly Shore was who Polly Shore was. Mm -hmm. Because he was able to take something that was nothing and make it stand out. And you actually, the, another moment of like weird, quiet nuance is when they come back from going to Mega Mountain and Dave's all mad, like, you, you should have come home, what'd you do? He says, we went to Mega Mountain, and he says, you went to Mega Mountain, and, and like, obviously, Sean Astin, right? Some credit has to be given to Sean Astin, because he's just improv with Pauly Shore, right? If Pauly Shore just made up everything that he said in those moments... Then well yeah and and well so like you got to get to the best part of that scene though right, right. because the, the 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 heart of that scene is once Polly Shore kind of gets into his spiel and Sean Aston's going along with him all of a sudden Fraser breaks out what might be like the best Polly Shore impression I've ever heard. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, the meat of that scene for me is when Polly Shore goes, "Yeah, they're running the Viper in reverse." Now, first of all, we just saw them on the Viper. And they weren't running the Viper in reverse. 
We don't know how the Viper works. <laughs> I, I know how to ride. Oh, oh, is the Viper always a reverse coaster? And today they're running it forward. Seijin, <laughs> don't fuck with me. They're not running the Viper in reverse. Um, it's just one of those situations where, like, that is said, and it's like, well, that didn't happen. That is Polly Shore making something up on it. And Sean Astin's response to that, he's like so sad that he didn't get invited to Mega Mountain to ride the Viper in reverse. <laughs> Well, but like, but you're not yeah, wrong. Like, Brendan Fraser coming out of that, into, yeah. Because then, because then Brendan Fraser starts talking like Paulie Shore, and then David's react, Dave's reaction. God, I can't mix the two of them up. Dave's reaction and like, and the whole moment becomes like he's he's becoming you. Like, like there's this chance that we have here to like to help this dude become like a human being, and instead he's becoming the weasel. Right? There's this idea that he's like he's. He, Polly Shore is is influencing him in this way that Dave is kind of upset about because Dave is starting to realize that he wants to grow up, and then there's this moment of like, "Fuck, is this what you've been doing to me? Are you the re are you holding me back?" And and no, that's not what it is, right? Like Dave is just his own worst enemy in in all of these situations. But it's just it becomes this whole conversation and this whole context about the ways in which they are all kind of like <laughs> forming and treating each other and how their situation is all kind of growing. And it, and that's what I mean is like there's this beautiful story here about this idea of this like this pure innocent naive being is brought into this world of Encino in 1992 and this is the way in which it changes and affects him but because he is so pure he is also able to change and affect them by the end of the movie like that's the Disney magic and the problem is with that movie is that's never what it is and now I know the reason why it's never why that is is because a third of that group I just mentioned in that scene didn't exist before <laughs> very true how how do you get how do you come back from the white fang scene to go on get on the side of the road yeah. if you don't have Polly Shore? It blows me away. But back yeah. to Encino Woman. The the really interesting thing is it feels like it's trying to highlight an issue existing at the time yeah. during the time. Where Encino Man, totally that was not the case, but now when we watch it, 20 uh, years later 19 years later we can see oh here are the problems here is how the toxic masculinity of the time influenced how these characters are written and portrayed right yeah with something like a Cena woman they're like they turn all those traits in the men up to 11 in order to show how them trying to objectify Lucy is affecting her as that perfect naive being this right. this pure innocence and it's really it's uncomfortable to watch and i give encino woman the reason why i think encino woman is the better movie is in encino man dave learns no lesson mm -hmm. dave is the same character start to finish and 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 also in in terms of being the same person from the beginning to the end he winds up with robin just because because that's what's supposed to happen to the nice guy at the end. David in Encino Woman, you kind of see him growing and changing. Yeah, I mean it's not it's not a it's not a well written story at all, but he does in fact lose Lucy at one point because of the way that he treats her. Like she says, like, no, I'm gonna make this choice to not be with you because you're an asshole. And it isn't until he acknowledges what he did wrong that she takes him back. Like there is there is some agency present for her in, in all of that. Whereas like Robin is at no point given any like real chance to like talk about A, B, or C. She she we are told from the get-go that she always kind of wanted Dave and Dave was the one that said no. And now she's with another guy, so she can't be with Dave. It isn't until she loses that other guy that she is then like like, okay, now I can be with Dave again. There's never a moment where she's just like, I don't want to be with anyone. Like, like she's never given that opportunity to just be her own independent self. Whereas whereas with Lucy, she she does like take the chance at her own independence for a while because this dude's an asshole. Um and then there's that yeah. beautiful scene with Lucy and Fiona yeah. where like Fiona talks about just how fucking broken the industry has made her. Yeah. And it's just like, oh God, that came from freaking nowhere and mm -hmm. also the museum scene right like where that comes in 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 encino woman is him showing her 
the like zoo books of the Paleolithic era and then being right. like, that's all gone. That's done. I didn't think you could make that scene in the museum more heartbreaking, but like they found a way. Like that really hit me. I was disappointed that our version of it like kind of smash cut into that sequence. Yeah. Bec I don't know. It's yeah. it's a it's a trip. Encino Woman is a trip. Oh, also, I don't think I ever finished this. I thought that when they introduced his sister, that was she was going to be the one who cleaned her off screen. So then you were going to have the she's all that reveal moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which honestly I would have felt a lot safer with than yeah, the idea than of... Than the yeah. black and white silent film slapstick a fever dream within a fever dream inception moment. Yeah. That, I mean, it happened. We both saw it. But I, I wouldn't believe it happened if I hadn't just seen it a, a few hours ago. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's seen a woman is a movie that I'm very happy that I watched, but I'm going to take the opportunity right now to say I don't recommend anybody bothering to try and find it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will, I will agree. Uh, if you're going on this exact journey. If you are able to double feature Encino Man and Encino Woman, I would. That's the only way that I would recommend seeing Encino Woman. I'm not going to show it to friends. Mm -hmm. I, I, like this is it. But it's one of those films that, after watching it, it, it definitely deserved to be acknowledged as more than just this cavalcade of a certain type of person that was prevalent in the '90s. And has kind of become co-opted and sold out to the entertainment machine. Yeah. Yeah, man. The, I mean, the stars aligned and this was the perfect way for you and I to to, to invest in it. And I I think this is the perfect way for anybody else to take it in. Is like, come on this journey with us. Listen to the last five years of the Brendan Fraser History Month and then come to this episode. And, and this is this is the right time for us to be walk, talking about this movie and for, for us as a group to be like embracing this film for a short moment. We need to talk about the final scene of Encino Woman. And okay. then I, I think we're good. They get married and they have kids. And then Dave admits that he's a submissive. I'm not king shaming. I'm not king shaming. There's also a beautiful food porn scene in the also, beginning of this Q -Bert movie. Also, there's Q-Bert babies. No, wait. I'm no. mixing up my movies. Hold no. on, wait. Sorry. <laughs> but it feels like q babies. It does indeed, yes. <laughs> and she has that whole speech about, you know, shopping, the procurement of goods to make oneself feel better about one's place in the universe. And I'm just like, what happened in seeing a woman? <laughs> We've ruined you. What happened? We broke you. Oh no, this world has destroyed. I kind of wanted you to wind up with Chris. I'm going to yeah. be honest. She's yeah. the best character in this movie. And she's unnamed for 57 minutes, including commercial breaks. I mean, there's never a moment in this movie where she is not concerned about Lucy in some way. Like, at first, there is definitely, like, this this attitude where where she's a little worried that Lucy is uh, unkempt and unclean. And she's just saying, we need to, like, we, we, basically, she's like, you need to actually take care of her. Stop her from building a nest in your fucking fireplace, you <laughs> animal. <laughs> And then, like, later on, she, she's just, she is consistently worried about the well-being of Lucy in a way that nobody else in this movie is. And even that is giving too much credit to this character, because, again, I, I don't I don't want to express that I think that any part of this movie is the right move. But, but at least there are moments with her where she shows concern for Lucy in a way that nobody else does. And I think she takes, there's also the weird thing that Lucy goes to, like, first of all, Lucy's level of independence in this movie is very fun to, for me mm. because of the fact that Link is never alone. He is almost always with either Stoney or Dave. Yeah. And it's, and so you only see him as a prop to one of those characters. He, he very has very little agency. So then you get to see Lucy in these moments where she is alone and she's kicking ass. Can we get the name of the actress who plays Lucy? I feel real bad <laughs> that we haven't yeah. name checked her at this point. It's uh, it's Catherine Catherine Cousy or Catherine Catherine Cousy, Cousy right? Yeah, I wasn't yeah. sure if that was her. All right, so it is Catherine Cousy. Good for me. I wrote that down because I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's the person who plays it. And um, it's Annabeth Geisel who ends up playing Chris. I want to give her credit too 
because she's very good and she has gone on and continued acting. Not in Do anything. You know, uh, sorry, go ahead. Finish your no, thing. no, no. Just not in like anything's hyper substantial, but she has had a career. It's not like she didn't see a woman and nothing else. So, so Catherine Cousy does one other movie in 1996. Uh, she shows up in a small bit part. Uh, I'll give you two dollars if you can tell me what it is. In the army now. <laughs> no. But, good guess, Biodome. She shows up as one of the hippie vigilantes in Biodome. That's that's even more insane. That Polly Shore doesn't show up. There's a moment where David is hiding out in a Marge Simpson wig, and I was, like, convinced it was just Polly Shore. <laughs> and I'm like, that's great. Like, I don't need him to have any lines. He just needs to be in the background in one scene. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just... I don't know. It's a, it's a trip. And seeing a woman is a trip. And I can't, I miss the time where this is a thing that would happen. Yeah. Yeah, man. I like, yeah, I, it's one of those things where like, I don't want to, I don't want to elevate this particular movie for all of the problems that it has. But man, I really wish more people were taking a stab at this sort of stuff nowadays with our like sensibilities right like like that just it just doesn't happen you know you have your straight to dvd sequels and maybe that's where it's gone but it just doesn't feel the same because there's not that sense of like you had to be there like i remember sunday night disney movies saturday afternoon films on on wb and fox like they were the kinds of things where like my family would stop what we were doing and watch a movie together and it was an on for and it was a it was a TV movie, right? Like and and this was the time it came on, so this was the time when it happened. And then we would go to school the next day, and and like people would talk about the movie that they want that we all watched the night before. Like like this is, the, it, there's something, there's something about the the like the zeitgeist effect that that these movies had, and we only kind of get that now if something is deemed worth it. And this was a time when everything kind of had to be consumed by everyone, and I miss that. Because we didn't have any other choice. I mean, cable was something that had emerged and existed, but I always think about my parents talking about we had three channels. So the thing that was worth watching, everybody watched and talked about it the next day. Mm -hmm. And, like, we could easily do that. I, I mean, Disney Plus, with their Friday releases of these shows... And I feel like if I don't watch it that day, I'm going to be spoiled. Sometimes I'm going to be spoiled by Disney itself. Yeah. They're going to spoil it with a tweet or something. Like, did you like so-and-so's new costume? And I'm like, well, so-and-so was dead. What are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, th that's purely fictional. I didn't spoil anything for you people out there in America who might not be caught up on things. Um... But it is. They could do that. They could drop a Disney Plus original film and have the pomp and circumstance of these Disney film presents. And it's weird that, like, maybe it's coming somewhere down the line. What they need to do, though, is they need to say one night only. Like, yeah. after this, it's not going to be available for three months. You know, the, that's, that's, the, that's the trick of it, is you drop these things now, and then you say, once it's there, it's there. Well, nobody's going to fight for it then. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to make the time for it now when they can get to it later. The trick with these things was, like we talked about with this at the beginning of this, this movie, if you didn't watch this on TV in 1996, you didn't, you, odds are you didn't see this movie. Like, you just, it just didn't happen. <laughs> exactly. And it's... I don't know. I do kind of miss that. Remember, like, mini series events mm -hmm. where, like, yeah, you'd man. watch it, like, one week, you'd watch an episode each night, and during the day, you'd talk about it at school? I, I have specific memories of Storm of the Century, Stephen King's miniseries. That was the really creepy one about the guy coming to town to take all the kids away. Mm -hmm. um, Merlin, the, the Sam Neill Merlin um, movie. And Martin Short, oddly, I think is the other big one in that one. Um, uh, and then uh, Dune, the the sci-fi. I, I own on DVD special edition because I ordered it when it was on TV. I, oh, I bought the Dune William Hurt edition from, like, fucking sci-fi. And I love that stupid collection. I watch it at least once every two or three years um uh, yeah man i know exactly what you're talking about though yeah like 10th kingdom that's the one that jumps Tenth to mind kingdom. for me oh man with john larrikett right yeah Jeez. oh man surface was a a mini series event that was a lie though that was 10 episodes and they ran every week 
but they're like, this is a limited sp- thing. We're never going to show Surface again. You know what show I miss? And the, the last one is Camp. Do you remember Camp at all? Oh. Uh, it was a adult, it, not an adult summer camp. It was a family summer camp, which are okay. things that exist. So kind of like Dirty Dancing. So it was really interesting because all these people came together for camp in this eight episode series. So like they obviously have relationships because they spend every summer together, like Mm -hmm. adults and children that was on NBC. And it's like gone from the memories of everybody, man. Well, it just, it's just one of those things. And I mean, and that's the nature, right? That's the nature of something like Encina woman is that it's a flash in the pan and then it's gone. I believe it had a European release on VHS and that's it. Man. And that is not what we have at all. Are there any final thoughts on Encino Woman? No. Um, you know, even if Michael Eisner's not at Disney anymore, you should still let him show up on TV every now and then. <laughs> that's that's a good point. Uh, I will say this. Uh, if you're interested in watching Encino Woman after everything that we've said, hit, hit me up at the Say Report. I might be able to point you in the right direction to find it. But just know, it is a trial by fire. And no <laughs> Bix allowed. Man. You will need to beat God, the universe, and something stronger to claim your copy of Encino Woman. Yeah, I think we can point you to a crusty version of the film or two. Yeah, man. None of those tasty nugs. God damn, all the we icy. Sneaked, <laughs> we snaked a peek at it, yeah? Yeah. Uh, now you're just <laughs> Canadian. <laughs> That was the trick with Pauly Shore all along. He was only just Canadian. Oh no! All right. I, I will. I, here's here here's a little tidbit on our way out the door. So there's a lot of gross stuff in like the the Pauly Shore of of, uh, of Encino Man. Um, babehood is one that should definitely be lost to time. Um, I'll let you just assume what that means. But in this list of Pauly Shoreisms, the best one on this list is in all caps, shush, meaning shut up. <laughs> I don't think that that was a Polly Shoreism. <laughs> I think he just goes, shush. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I need to say? You know what needs to happen? Because it's Brendan Fraser History Month, and I want to tie it into Brendan Fraser again. Yeah, let's do that. This is a movie that is a direct sequel to Encino Man, based on everything that is present in this movie, and Brendan Fraser is not in it, right? It is not without my Fraser, Fraserless sequels, all of that. But the reminder that Brendan Fraser goes on to play the character of Link from Encino Man in two other films. Yeah. Son-in-law and in the army now. Yep. So, like, I have to imagine, right, as we're going to explore, I don't know if we're going to explore it next week or if spoilers for what the sixth year of Brendan Fraser History Month is going to be. He's done a lot of uncredited cameos. <laughs> like, yeah, but yet didn't show up in this, man. <laughs> absurd amount of uncredited cameos. And he doesn't even need to, like, all he would need to do is be in one sequence. When they're, like, revolting in Encino, if he were just there smashing stuff, it looks like an insert shot anyway. Like, it's from something completely different. It would have been nice. It would have been nice to see Brendan Fraser in this one. But it is cool that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have make time for Encino Woman, but Polly Shore needs me in two movies. I understand what I owe him to the Fraser Mobile. What do you got, Siege? You there? <laughs> Michael Eisner is just wheezing off his gig, man. <laughs> Hollywood Pictures. I just also want to shout out Hollywood Pictures is the studio behind the first Encino Man. And we have not looked at enough Hollywood Pictures movies. And on the Say Report as a whole, I feel like we need to start exploring them. <laughs> Just a little yeah. bit. I, uh, I'm not as opposed to that. I'm dumb, totally down. All right. Very cool. All right. So if you have any other Flash in the Pan Saturday, Sunday night movies that Seijin should seek out because it's his turn to go on a vision quest... You can find him on Twitter at Siege versus the World and recommend them to him. 
Uh, and uh, if you have access in in any way to uh, Encino Woman, uh, that is <laughs> not. How did I put it to you, Devin? Uh, th- that does not have the. the no, <laughs> when, uh, when we were texting the back and forth about this, I said it has the the audio quality of oh uh, of like gears being ground through a Cenobite's uh, xylophone in fucking hell. Like I was like, like if you have any version of this film that is actually proper quality, hit me up because I'm interested to see it minus the Eisner. Yeah, that'd I'd be see interesting. It the world. <laughs> All right, so I guess I'm also gonna say if you want to reach me, I'm at Devin D Decker. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Cause, no, I'm cause we too, just... no, I'm too fed up. I mean, I'm too caught up in myself, man. Oh, you know, I'm going to steal this moment then to say, there's a moment where David and Encina Woman is called Devin. And that was cool for me. <laughs> I wish I saw that when I was 10 years old. Maybe it would have changed my life. Maybe not. Also, reminder, we have a very special episode coming out later this week. So, mm, yep. and it's all about Brendan Fraser still. That very special episode is going to be about Brendan Fraser. So look for that wherever you get your podcasts on Thursdays. But until then, before we go wheeze some grindage, Will, please bring us home, buddy. Thank you for listening to the Say Report with your host Devin Decker and Stephen Serwick. Please follow the guys on Twitter and Facebook by searching for The Say Report. And you can always subscribe on your podcast channel so this is delivered straight to you and you can enjoy it every week. With apologies to your mother, we'll see you next time.